And now you can also put on your glasses here, your magic glasses here, so that we can visualize the gamma ray properties of this sequence. What is that we see? What is that the shell laminations are telling us in terms of gamma ray logs? And how to understand the gamma ray logs to assess petrophysical properties of Shelley sensors. Hello, we are back. Let me introduce the objectives of the following presentation. We are going to define the properties of shell. We are going to describe the effect of shell on the storage and flow properties of sensors and also on the corresponding well logs. And along those lines, we are going to define what the volumetric concentration of shell is. We are going to look at the cases of shell sandstone laminated rocks. We are going to describe and define the case of sandstones where shell comes in the form of grain coating clay minerals, also known as dispersed shell. And lastly, we're going to introduce a case of structural shell in sandstones. All of these with important implications on storage flow properties of sensors. The material that I'm going to cover here is part of PowerPoint presentations that are uploaded on Canvas. Those are the geological model and natural gamma ray logs. I'm also have I have also recorded a section of this lecture based on the compendium part one and part two. And last, please make sure that you read chapter eight of the textbook. There are many important details there. So what are the important remarks? The important remarks here are that clay or shale can affect all the petrophysical properties of a rock, storage and flow, be it porosity, permeability, irreducible water saturation, capillary pressure, relative permeability, and in isotropy. Therefore, it is very important to diagnose not only the volume, the volumetric concentration of shell, but the specific type or topology in which shell places itself in the rock. And the types of clay minerals that are present in the shell, among other things, if we want to understand the effect the shell has on petro petrophysical properties and well logs. Practically, all well logs are affected by presence of clay or shell. And presence of clay or shell can also cause an isotropic behavior in the electrical, fluid transport, and elastic properties of rocks. So what are shells? Here is an example of an outcrop of a fluvial sedimentary sequence where we have some layers of sandstone right here, the light color ones, and we have some layers of shell, the dark color ones. The uh, important thing is all of these rocks are classic rocks formed by the packing of grains, but they have vastly different petrophysical properties because of their dominant grain sizes, presence or not presence of clay, and other things. Also, despite the fact that the sandstones, the, dark, the light color ones, do not have, at least in this picture, layers of shell, they could have presence of clay minerals in their pore structure. And as a consequence, that clay mineral could have an impact on the petrophysical properties of the rocks. So that's also an important consideration here. Another example of shells. Here we have a case of another classic sedimentary sequence where we have the layers of uh, 
sanson those are the light colors and then we have layers of shell and then at the bottom of this sequence right here we have layers of sandstone and layers of shell in about the same thicknesses so the concentration of shell is high but the uh, thickness relative thickness of the layers of shell and sandstone is different with respect to the upper layers these are also important considerations in the process and here we have an example of a turbidite sedimentary sequence where we can observe the layers of shell right here and in fact if you look closely at the layers of shell you will find that there is a pronounced alignment of particles uh, indicating facility this alignment of particles uh, causes an isotropic behavior of the shells in terms of electrical conductivity and elastic properties and again the layers of sandstone are the ones that are in uh, light colors but sandstones can also have presence of clay minerals in their pore structure another view of the um, uh, clastic sedimentary sequence, a turbidite sedimentary sequence. Uh, it's important to understand in these sequences the relative thicknesses of the layers of sandstone, the layers of shell, because the relative thicknesses are also going to affect the petrophysical properties of the whole sequence as well as the well locks. So, what is shell? Shell is generally defined as a composition of several things. One is the presence of salt, presence of clay, and also presence of porosity and presence of fluid in the pore space. The important thing about shells is that they are impermeable. And why are they impermeable? Because the grain sizes, their grain sizes are smaller than 63 micrometers. That value is defined because if you have grain sizes of that size made of quartz particles, the, uh, there's a balance between friction forces and gravity forces when they are immersed in water, so these particles become or uh, are prone to suspension, so they no longer sediment. Um, and because of that, because of the uh, suspension properties, they have a different way to aggregate and they have a different way to separate from the rest of the larger grain sizes. So that's an important element of those shells. But what are the components? Well, shells all include salt, clay minerals, porosity, the fluids that they have in the pore space. And it's important to note that the porosity and the pore pressure of shells can vary considerably. There's no specific value. There are some shells that are very tight, very low porosities. There are shells that can have up to 20% porosity or more. And the pore pressure of shells can vary considerably because of a number of things. Now, there are inorganic and organic shells. Inorganic shells are those which do not include organic material or if they do is negligible so they include predominantly water in their pore space uh, and their fluids in the pore space are irreducible in the sense that uh, the, the permeability of the rock is negligible in organic shells on the other hand we can have water and organic material and organic material can be formed in the form of solid material as well as fluids. It can be keratin, bitumen, um, gas, oil, condensate, and as I said, they can also have organic material in their solid composition. Uh, it is also important to say that the solid composition of shells can vary considerably. So not only do they tend to have quartz, but also calcite, dolomite, and some interesting minerals associated with diagenesis such as pirate graphite clay minerals and as i said before organic material but the common denominator of shells is that they have negligible permeability because of the dominant 
grain sizes. Remember that permeability is proportional to the square of the grain diameter. So when these diameters are of the order of micrometers and you square then to the minus 12, so the permeability decreases extremely fast and to the point of being negligible. And because of that, all of the pore fluids that we have in shells are predominantly at irreducible or residual saturation conditions. Now, what is a shell and what is a mudrock? Well, it turns out that shells are, by definition, a shell is a fissile rock because the components, the grains, the clays, they have a predominant orientation or lamination, which causes an isotropy in some properties, such as electrical conductivity and the elastic properties. On the other hand, when we say mud rocks, those are shells that, have, that are not fissile because they don't have a predominant orientation, so they don't exhibit an isotropy. Now, mudstones, siltstones, and claystones, they're all subsets of a mud rock. They, they have no facility, no predominant orientation, but the difference among them is the dominant particle size as indicated here. So when we look at a, uh, an outcrop, we can find shells of different kinds. Here is a mud rock with organic material. The dark colors in this example indicate organic material. Here we have a shell with facility. So there's a dominant orientation. And here we also have a combination of shells with facility and mud rocks. And the colors are also uh, not constant and they have, uh, or they exhibit their, the colors as such because of the dominant solid composition, in some case organic material, in some case they have presence or not presence of iron-based minerals or chloride. Those uh, elements in dominance are the ones that cause the predominant color of these shells. As another example is the Eagle Four formation. Here is the, the Eagle Four formation, and uh, it has a predominant calcareous composition. And below that, we have the Buda formation. If you remember, in the last lecture, I showed you a beautiful core um, sample at the boundary of the Eagle Fort and the Buda Formation, and we were able to see how the gamma ray logs vary when you go across this boundary, uh, because the Buda is predominant uh, carbonate composition. In this example, the gamma ray logs, they tend to exhibit very low values, whereas in the presence of, across the Eagle Fort, we have a uh, presence of organic material, which manifests itself as a high relative values of uranium gamma ray log. And um, the other important point is, as I said before, is that the dominant solid composition here is carbonates. And another location in the Eagle Four formation is uh, this photograph, and it is a place here to indicate the presence of solid organic material. In this example, here shown in the dark colors. So the presence of shells, the type, the volume, um, or, or geometry or topology of shell depends on where they come in their corresponding sedimentary environment. So the shell is placed in the rocks in a way that is dominated by two things. One is the genesis, that is the sedimentary environment, and the second one is the diagenesis, that is after burial of the sediments, uh, increase of pressure, increase of um, temperature. The initial composition of the rock, the grains and fluids, is modified and therefore um, new components and new solid elements arise as a consequence of that. Uh, examples of laminated shell are this. Another example here, 
the composition of the shell is not the same in the two cases and uh, the volumetric concentration is not the same. Here is another example of laminated shell, laminated shell, and here we have examples of conglomerates where um, even though we don't have shell, shell can be present in the form of fragments, small fragments of shell, and also we can have shell in the form of grain coating clay minerals, similar to what we have here. And we can, as I said before, we some of the clasts that make this rock can also have presence of uh, shell, and presence of shell will cause microporosity in those grains. So, so the presence and type of shell is a consequence of the genesis, the sedimentary environment, and the diagenesis of the rocks. So, how do we define the volume of shell? Well, in a rock, we have solids and fluids, and of course. The process is a fraction of the rock occupied by fluids. But when we include shell in a rock, we are including not only the solid composition of shell, but also the fluid composition. So anytime we refer to shell and we say the volumetric concentration of shell is such, we're referring to an aggregate of solids and fluids that come together with the shell and that's the fraction of that rock of the uh, that's the fraction of shell that occupies the pore space so an example here is a picture of a uh, whole core of shell acquired in the deep water gulf of mexico and this whole core is uh, that's a dimension in inches here and the dark layers are correspond to shell lamina and the light layers correspond to sandstone lamina and uh, one of the photographs is a direct photograph and the second one is an ultraviolet photograph the ultraviolet photographs is works by shining light and looking ultraviolet light and looking at the uh, reflectance and hydrocarbons have a way to reflect and when uh, the rock is shined with an ultraviolet light. Bottom line is that the uh, light colors, the light blue colors that you see here in the ultraviolet photograph are indicating presence of hydrocarbon. So despite the fact that this rock has a significant amount of shell in the pore space right here in the, in the rock itself, all of those lamina, it has hydrocarbons. So will it produce hydrocarbons in a proper financially viable way here and the answer is well it depends on how much shell we have what is the volumetric concentration of shell second what are the properties petrophysical properties of the lamina of sensor so if the lamina of sensor have good porosity and if the lamina of sensor have good permeability because they have relatively large grain sizes then this becomes attractive. So, in summary, not because a rock like this has a very large volumetric concentration of shell, give and take, in this rock maybe we're talking about 50%, we should discard it because the remaining lamina of sandstone have good porosity, they have good hydrocarbon saturation, and they also have good permeability. So it's important to be able to diagnose those cases where the conditions are ideal for storage and flow. As an example, in a case of sandstone shell laminations, like shown here, we refer to the volumetric concentration of shell with the indirect concept of net to gross, which is one minus the volumetric concentration of shell. And that volumetric concentration of shell um, is defined in, as the following. Let's take apart the shell, the, the layers of shell. Let's take them apart and pile them together and do the same thing with the layers of sand. So we separate them. And the, question, the, the, the issue is how much of each one we have. And that's precisely what constitutes the net to gross. So the fraction of the sandstone 
portion of the rock the relative fraction the, the fraction of uh, the relative proportion of the sensor fraction of the rock is going to be occupied by sensor is going to be the net to gross and again this rock is going to be um, petrophysically attractive if, we have, if the sandstone fraction of the rock has good petrophysical properties that is good porosity and good permeability because of grain sizes now so as an example of this um, in the case of laminated uh, uh, shell laminated sandstone sandstone's important thing is to understand the storage and flow properties and one way to think about this is uh, like a lasagna where we have lamina of pasta those will be the shells and then in between the lamina of pasta we have the attractive part of the lasagna and how attractive is this part of the lasagna well it depends on the quality of the rocks will it produce will it be tasty yes if the quality of the sensors is good so it's important to understand this you like to eat lasagna now another element of this um, analysis when we have sense and shell laminated systems is the effect of the thickness as an example let's look at a synthetic case where we have a sequence of sensors and shells with different thicknesses at the top here both sandstone and shell layers have about the same thickness but as the uh, we go down in the well the um, thicknesses both of them decrease so how do well logs behave in those cases so it happens that the relative size of the thicknesses compared to the volume of investigation of the tool will have an effect on what the well logs will see so unfortunately not all the well logs have super high resolution to detect and analyze thin layers so we see the whole of them the average of everything but when we have very thin layers of sands on a shell then the gamma ray log will have a tendency to decrease like done here and so it's important to understand that sometimes the gamma ray log decreases not because the grain sizes are decreasing because in all of these, these uh, in this example where we also have the thorium gamma ray log the uranium gamma ray log and the potassium gamma ray log what we're seeing is that the gamma ray log has decreased that has uh, increased decreased at the bottom here because of the relative presence of, of the relative thicknesses between the portions of sandstone and shell and the volume of investigation of the tool so it doesn't mean that the layers of sandstone that we have here had bad petrophysical properties it just means that the compound of layers of shell and sandstone has been seen as an average so we have to be careful not to confuse those with rocks that tend to have smaller grain sizes or more clay as an example here is a uh, an outcrop of a tight influence delta where we see that at the top of the outcrop we have very thick relatively thick layers of sands and those are the light colors and then we have interspersed layers of shell which are very thin as we move toward the bottom of the sequence we uh, observe that the average thickness of the layers of sandstone begins to decrease to at the end be the thickness of sandstones be very similar to the thickness of shells so what is the consequence well the consequences is that at the top we will have relatively low values of gamma ray log whereas at the bottom the values of gamma ray log will increase indicating perhaps more shell but we have to remind ourselves that in this particular case the gamma ray log is increasing at the bottom not because uh, 
the grain sizes are decreasing is just that the relative thickness between the layers of sandstone and the layers of shale is decreasing. But the petrophys petrophysical quality of all the layers of sandstone remains approximately the same. And, and, in a, and why does this happen? Well, in a delta system like the one shown here, where we have the main uh, river and the tributaries, as, as soon as the sediment begins, begins to reach the uh, shoreline here, then the contact with the water in the ocean causes that the different sizes of sediment begin to act different with respect, differently with respect to gravity. Some of them are going to remain in suspension. Some of them, depending on their size, are going to be deposited right away. So this interaction between the water and of the ocean and the dumping of sediments will be a natural way to separate the sizes of the particles. And as a consequence, when we are at different locations in the delta system, let's say A and B, when we have a delta system that is advancing in this direction, then what happens is that the uh, river is building upon previous delta systems. And consequently, what we find is at the top, we begin to have um, material that has larger grain sizes and at the bottom material that has smaller grain sizes. Let's look at potential wells that will be uh, drilled at locations A and B here. And so if we do a cross section, that would be the shoreline and this will be the ocean. You find that at the top we have predominant of uh, sandstones with relatively large grain sizes, whereas at the bottom we begin to have thinner layers of sandstone and thinner layers of shell. And consequently, what we see is that the gamma ray log tends to increase at the bottom of the sequence, similar to what we showed in the synthetic example and also uh, similar to what we have in this outcrop. So it's important to know that the relative thicknesses of the layers of sandstone and, sh and shell will also have an important effect on the gamma ray logs and also on the petrophysical properties of the rock. But if the layers of sandstone continue to have very good petrophysical properties, that's um, they are not to be discarded for, for flow. Another second way, important way in which shell is present in the pore space is a so-called clay coating grain minerals. How do they work? Okay, so this is an important uh, type of clay or shell, if you will. So what happens is that when rocks are initially deposited, plastic rocks like these grain packs, they are have their own surface free of clays, but as um, they are buried, temperature increases, pressure increases, and because of that, the um, conditions of the minerals that were included in the rock are no longer the same. So the rock tends to metamorphose itself into minerals that are more stable under the new conditions. So, uh, and this is how the grain coating grain minerals form. Essentially, it is a process whereby the original rock, the original grains, metamorphose on their surface into clay minerals. These clay minerals are called orthogenic clay minerals because they are formed in place. It's not that the clay came with the sedimentary environment. It's just that the grains were separated by their sizes and then when subject to um, burial, chemical alterations due to pressure and temperature, then the metamorphosis took place. And the particular clay mineral that grows on the surface of these grains will depend on the composition of the rocks. Very often when you have uh, plagioclases or potassium rich um, composition in the grains, then we know that we can form uh, chloride. Chloride is a type of clay. It's, some, it's almost like we are 
painting the surface of the grains with clay paint. And that causes important uh, effects on the petrophysical properties of the rocks and also on the well logs. Please do not confuse the effect of metamorphosis of the grains into clay minerals on their surface with the effect of grain cementation. The effect grain cementation happens because when the fluids are flowing to the rock, they can uh, precipitate material. And the precipitation of the material is not, could be clay, but it could be other things. And um, essentially that precipitation reduces the pore space, but it's not the same process that gives rise to uh, grain coating clay minerals, which is, as I said before, because of metamorphosis of the original grains. And this is a close-up view of that situation. Uh, this is 10 microns, micrometers, and you can see all of this clay chloride, um, clay minerals growing on the surface. What this growth causes is that the aggregate of the clay minerals, their thickness, and the water that is formed in between the clay minerals, which uh, forms microporosity. So essentially the aggregate that we have here can be regarded as a shell. And that's the reason why this is called dispersed shell. But um, it should be called grain coating clay minerals. And this is a, another view of chloride. Uh, size is 10 micrometers. Please note, these are the original minerals that covered the surface of the grains. And all of these uh, chloride growing on the surface of the grains it manifested itself uh, in very thin wafers with hexagonal shapes placed in almost random ways and the space between the clay minerals, the wafers, is occupied by water. And that water is not movable, it's attached to the uh, clay minerals and remains there in the form of microporosity. Other examples of grain coating chloride, uh, this is one micrometer. Please notice the shape of these chloride minerals, hexagonal shapes, placed in random directions, oriented. The surface to volume ratio of these clay minerals is extremely high because it's a volume that is flattened, if you will, into poker chips. These hexagonal shapes look like poker chips and all the space between these um, poker chips is occupied by water and that constitutes a microporosity. Another example of grain coating elite, please note how the original grains are over here. They had an original surface to volume, but the presence of clay in the growing on their surface has dramatically increased the volumetric, I mean, the dramatic increase the surface to volume, and with that, the microporosity, and all of the porosity associated, the microporosity associated with the presence of grain coating clay minerals is immovable. So the consequence is that the effective porosity of this rock is going to drastically decrease. So total porosity may be the same or slightly lower but effective porosity will be much lower. And consequently, the permeability of this rock will also decrease. Other examples of these rocks are uh, smectite, kaolinite, and chloride. Please look at the uh, hexagonal shapes of both kaolinite and chloride. Chloride not only can grow in random shapes, but also in piles, accordion-like piles, similar to kaolinite. And Another important uh, grain coating clay is smectite. Smectite is one of the most interesting type of, types of clays. Um, the microporosity that we have here is the one that takes place between the walls of this growth that you see here. And uh, smectite is actually very interesting because when placed in contact with water, it uh, swells. So it just absorbs all the water and, and grows in shape, swells. This has this beautiful way of growing like a, like a spring where a place where the water gets in between its uh, internal layers and it grows in size. And when it does that, 
then it cre uh, drastically increases the pore space and if the fluids have nowhere to go then that causes an increase in pore pressure this is one of the traditional ways in which pore pressure increases by presence of clay minerals growing metamorphosing taking the space originally occupied by the uh, pores and when the fluids faced with smaller volume to occupy in the rock um, are faced with that then they need to move out but if they don't have a way out because the permeability is very low then naturally the pore the pressure of those fluids increases the other interesting aspect of smectite is one of the clay minerals that is used widely for medical applications more interestingly you're not going to like this but for um, treatment of diarrhea the way it works is that when you have diarrhea of course we are evacuating fluids uh, quite rapidly and we want to stop that because we want to stop the dehydration so what we do is you give medicine traditionally is kaopictate that has kaolinite and what happens is that when you dump it in the digestive system it does so by attaching it absorbs a great amount of water and consequently now there's no longer free water to flow and evacuate in the form of diarrhea so that's one of the applications of clays isn't that interesting now one last type the third and perhaps the least common and perhaps the least important case of presence of shell in the pore space is a so-called structural shell what is that well this this picture is a very interesting picture because if you look closely at the grains that make up this classic rock you are going to see that some of the grains here are actually made of shell so this 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 rock this uh, sandstone or conglomerate was formed by the grinding of um, shells so you grind the shell and you make class based on the shells and the consequence is that those clasps are going to have microporosity and that's how it works essentially you have fragments of, um, of, of, of grains or grains made of fragments of shell which have microporosity and this constitutes the so-called uh, structural shell because it's part of the grains that's what it structural means so consequently information evaluation to deal with shell we have to classify it before because uh, the classification is important because effects are going to be based on the types of classification so it could be laminated shell it could be dispersed shell or better named uh, sandstone with grain coding clay minerals or it could be structural shell most common one is laminated shell second most common one is grain coding clay minerals and the last the not so common is structural shell but we can also have combinations of all three the most common combination is to have laminated shell in which the lamina of sandstone are or include grain uh, grains with grain coating clay mineral so it's a combination of those three and and the consequences on flow storage and well logs will be different according to that so um, in summary we have these three types uh, please note that the reason why we have to take them into account is because uh, within the volume of investigation of the well logs and even within the volume of um, a plot that is used for laboratory experiments we can have all these three forms the lamina of sandstone lamina of shell the presence of grain coating clay or the presence of structural shell but when you look at a rock a complex rock like this then you say what the heck is going on here please look at this this is a classic rock with presence of laminated shell laminated shell laminated shell and of course the uh, relative sizes of the lamina of sandstone and shell varies across the rock 
and this rock produces hydrocarbons and the hydrocarbons are visible here by by the dark colored segments of the sensor and it is no surprise that hydrocarbons in this rock are found in the segments of the rock that are sandstone layers number one but sandstone layers with good storage and flow properties where you don't have a whole lot of lamina of um, shell and also where the individual layers of sandstone have have um, good proxy and relatively large grain sizes so they have good permeability so but when when we look at logs or when we look at core please all of these holes please note that these holes that you see here are essentially plugs that were taken from the core itself of a certain size and those plugs are sent subsequently sent to a laboratory to so the laboratory can can measure the porosity the permeability um, solid composition uh, capillary pressure relative permeability all of those things that are very important for flow conditions uh, so depending on where you take the plug you are going to have different properties but it is also important to understand that when you log these sequences the well logs are going to have a volume of investigation that is going to average over all of this and the question is will the average recognize the situation of um shaley sandstone i mean uh, laminated shells or grain coating clay because you can also have these sandstones here that perhaps have their um, individual grains to be coated with clay so that's an important thing bottom line is that we have to take into account the variability of rocks we have to take into account the type of shell and we also have to take into account the complexity of shells and in uh, some situations where we don't have high resolution well logs then we have to combine the analysis with core samples and core um, laboratory analysis so that we can compare core and logs and uh, calibrate our interpretations with uh, perform with well logs with the results obtained from core laboratory measurements so um, big question here is how do sandstone properties change with presence of shells so by now i have i hope i have convinced you that um, properties are going to change differently for storage and flow and importantly we are going to have drastic differences between total porosity and effective porosity remember that effective porosity is the fraction of the of the fluids occupying the pore space that will move in the presence of a pressure gradient so some because of the presence of microporosity associated with clays and shells that microporosity is not mobile it's part of the total porosity but it's not mobile so therefore it's not part of the effective porosity and because of that we are going to have differences in permeability capillary pressure and relative permeability for instance and um, in the case of laminated shells we're going to have also uh, in isotropic effects and uh, but please remember that in all cases shells have negligible permeability to um, further clarify the effect that shell especially the case of grain coating clay minerals have on some of the petrophysical properties let me give you this example suppose that you have a spherical grain of some size and let's say that the grain is made of quartz here several minerals including quartz they have a certain amount of surface electric charge and they have a sign of electric charge quartz for instance have a, has a certain surface density of charge which is negative clay minerals all of them have a negative surface electric charge there are all there are other minerals such as calcite for instance that have a positive electric charge on the surface and this is due to their crystalline properties and um, um, solid properties essentially and their composition and um, so what is the consequence of having surface 
electric charge, where the consequence is that water, which is uh, plotted here in the dark blue section, has is a polar fluid. And because it's a polar fluid, it has it has sensitivity to the presence of an electric field. So what happens is that these uh, uh, grains with surface elect negative surface electric charge will generate an electric field, and in the presence of water, water is going to be because it's a polar fluid is going to be attracted by that electric field, and is going to attach in the form of thin films on the surface of these grains. Now, the thickness of these thin films is going to be a function, a function of several things. One is the surface to volume specific surface of the grains, which in the case of spherical grains, this is 3 over R, where R is the radius of the uh, spherical grain. And of course, the composition of the grain will determine the surface density of charge and the sign of the electric charge. So that together, the uh, surface to volume specific surface and the surface density of charge will determine the thickness of this thin film. All right. Now, what happens if this uh, spherical grain suddenly begins to have grain coating clay? So this is what happens. The presence of grain coating clay shown here in these tiny fragments is going to do two things. It's going to bring additional surface to volume. It's almost like you're going to increase the original surface to volume, the, the surface, the specific surface of the original grain. And because clay minerals have a high surface density of, of negative electric charge, the effect is that we are going to also increase the surface density of charge of the new grain. Consequently, with the same conditions of size, we are going to have a thicker, thicker thin film or monolayer of water. That's the effect of the uh, presence of this grain coating clay mineral. Consequently, consequently, the, um, the clay is growing out, so that's decreasing the pore space. But also, initially, we had a, we had a certain amount of total porosity, which was the uh, volume occupied by this light colored water. But now, because the uh, thickness of the films has increased, the fraction or the uh, relative volume of the remaining shell of free water will decrease. So consequently, the effective porosity will decrease as a consequence of this situation. So that's actually what happens. We have increased the surface to volume because of this clay paint, if you will. We have increased the surface to volume of the original grains and we have increased the surface density of charge and consequently the thickness of the uh, Thin film has increased, and consequently, the uh, effective porosity has increased, and therefore the permeability has increased. And by the same token, the capillary pressure will um, will increase. Uh, so what happens here is that we have different effects uh, based on the different types of clays. And of course, different types of clays will have different surface charge density different um, surface to volume and the thickness of this uh, attached thin film will vary accordingly. And uh, needless to say, in uh, shells, everything that we see, for instance, in inorganic shells, the total process will be occupied by this dark shell of water. And therefore, all the water will be irreducible. You see that? There's another element that comes to this, which is the electrical double layer, but I'll talk about that later. Now, just want to remind you that water is a polar fluid. And the reason why we have these thin films uh, shown here in the dark blue color is because uh, 
the molecules of water, hydrogen and uh, oxygen, even though charges are balanced, there's a net separation between the charges. And that net separation of the charges, plus and minus, this net separation is what causes that the water molecule behave as a dipole. So as a dipole, in the presence of an electric field, it orients itself and, and uh, responds to that. Second point that I want to say is this. If you have um, sodium chloride in water, the cations of sodium uh, will have a positive electric charge. They create their own electric field. And because of that, they attract the molecules of water. And it turns out that they, not only they attract them, but also they um, orient them in a particular way. You can see the orientation here in the form of the, um, the negatives getting closer to the positives. And uh, also, there's a maximum number of molecules that can be attached, which in this case is six. And so per, for each one of the cations, uh, you need six molecules of water to uh, neutralize the electric field. And this explains why there is a maximum concentration of sodium chloride that can be dissolved in water because at some point you just run out of molecules of water. So that's uh, what we see in the cases of um, grain coating clay. It's a very, very significant effect that will decrease, in, will increase the micro porosity, it will decrease the um, effective porosity, and it will decrease the permeability and cause some other functions. So how does we, do we interpret well logs in the presence of shell? Well, the interpretation will have to be carried out depending on what type of shell we have. When, if we have a laminated shell, we will have to do it in one way. If we have grain coating clay, we will have to do it in a different way. And if we have structural shell, we will have to do it in a different way. Arch's equation is accurate only for the case of shell free rocks. In some cases, it remains accurate in the presence of shell, depending on the volumetric concentration of shell. But when the volumetric concentration of shell increases with respect to the porosity of the rock, then Arch's equation tends not to be accurate and we have to modify it in ways that allow us to still calculate the hydrocarbon saturation. Similarly with the neutron and density logs and similar with magnetic resonance and other logs. So we have to take into account everything in order to be able to um, quantify whether despite the fact that we have shell, there is um, good, the remaining uh, portion of the rock has good storage and flow properties. And and what happens with the well logs? Well, all the well logs will be affected by the presence of shell. So um, there will be a perturbation in their value. Gamma ray logs, resistivity logs, neutron porosity, density porosity, sonic, uh, for electric factor, magnetic resonance, all of them will be modified with respect to the original gamma ray logs in the presence of a clean rock. And the modification, this perturbation will depend on the volume of shell and the type of shell. And in many cases, it will also depend on the type of clay minerals. And um, one way to understand how these perturbations take place is to understand what the well logs read at the pure shell or what the petrophysical properties are of the pure shell. So when we started this lecture, I mentioned that there was a way to to uh, detect what the pure shell is or to decide, uh, diagnose where the pure shell is. And that pure shell gives us a reference because if you have a clean sandstone and you sprinkle the shell, which, um, um, I'm sorry, if you sprinkle the sandstone with shell, then the consequence is the well logs with the shell will tend to go toward the behavior of the well logs in a pure shell. And those are the perturbations that we have to do. So in essence, when we interpret uh, Shelley Sansons, our task is to identify the perturbation that we have in all of them so that the remaining part 
the clean part can be interpreted to assess the, um, the um, flow and storage properties of the rock. So in summary, I hope this was not a very long presentation. Let me just summarize that the shell can be present in sandstones in the form of laminated shell, grain coating clay minerals, also known as dispersed shell and structural shell, or combinations of all of the above. If it is very important to understand that the volumetric concentration of shell needs to be quantified to determine the effect that shell has on petrophysical properties and well locks. And uh, the effect depends not only on the concentration of shell, but also on the type of shell. So we have to diagnose the type of shell. And that is done with the Thomas Stiber diagram, which I'm going to talk about in the next presentation. And um, presence of shell, in other words, shell free sensors, causes the well logs to tend to behave as the well logs that what that we measure in a pure shell. And to conclude, I have a few review questions. These review questions are intended for you to uh, verify if the contents of the presentation of the lecture were properly assimilated and gives you a way to quality control the learning. And also I might use some of these questions to generate uh, exam questions for pop quizzes or uh, midterm exams, final exams. Uh, but the main intent is to revise and verify and understand whether uh, you understood the content of the presentation. And if you can answer the questions with no problem, that means that you understood everything. Uh, I have two sets of questions. The remaining lectures will tend to have, some of them will have review questions, some of them will not have, but the intent is to review content. And with that, thank you. And let's go on to the next presentation. Bye. <music>